Magandang hapon, mga kapatid. Good afternoon, my brothers and sisters. As you can see, I can still speak in tongues. And I can also translate. It's so wonderful to be back. I think it's been four years since we've been here last. And I was shocked when I got here. Pastor Greg and Angel have not changed a bit. Like, it's, it's like they own oil of Olay or something. It's like the gift of immortal youth. I mean, I'm going gray and, and I'm, I'm, my eyes are going on me and he looks the same. I don't know what it is, but, but praise God, he's, I think he's going to look the same until the resurrection takes place. <laughs> so brothers and sisters, it's such an honor to be with you here again on this blessed Good Friday. And thank you again for inviting me to be here. It's such an honor to be with you guys. We dearly miss you. We think of you often. And uh, every time we meet Filipino Christians or Filipino people, we, we always highly recommend Grace Church International. And I personally endorse this church to everyone that I meet. Uh, in fact, I, I promote it even on my social media. So, we read from the Word of God that our brother Lemuel, and man, Lemuel, he used to be this like little guy, and now he's, he's a man. He's a man's man. He's my man. And he's grown to be a mature man, and I've even seen some of his sermons. I was just so moved and, and so blessed to hear Pastor Lemuel Tupac preaching. What an honor it is. And that's because of his godly parents, Pastor Greg and Angel, who have been godly parents. We remember years ago when there was a health scare with, with our brother Lemuel. And I'll never forget that day, Pastor Greg was willing, like Abraham, to give up his son for God. And the Lord honored his faithfulness and, and brought restoration and healing. What a mighty God we serve. And so we read today, Good Friday, we read about, for example, John chapter 8, verses 33 to 38. We hear how Pilate was in town, and folks, you need to understand that if Pilate was not in Jerusalem at that time period, the Jews would have had Jesus stoned to death as they killed Stephen in the book of Acts chapter 7. And because it was the Passover, and because it was a celebration of freedom and deliverance, the Romans would always maximize their presence. The armies would come into Jerusalem because there was always an insurrection. There was always an attempted revolution because the Jews believed that at the Passover, the Messiah would appear. And it was at that time the Messiah would appear just like Moses did to deliver them out of the house of bondage of Egypt where they celebrated the first Passover. And so they believed Mashiach, the Messiah, would appear again at the Passover to deliver them from their enemies the Romans, and restore the kingdom of David through the son of David. And so we're told here that Jesus comes into Pilate's headquarters in John 18, 33, and the first thing that Pilate asks him is, are you the king of the Jews? Because you know it was a capital offense to claim to be a king when Caesar was the true king of the empire. There was no king above Caesar. And so to make the claim that you are a king was to make a claim of sedition. It was a claim of revolution. It was a claim of treason. And so Jesus would be condemned by the civil authorities for treason against the emperor. And he was condemned by the Jewish Sanhedrin, the Jewish court, for blasphemy, for claiming to be the son of God and the son of man who would come with the clouds of heaven. And so Jesus says to Pilate, he responds by saying, do you say this of your own accord, or are you simply saying what others have told you? And Pilate, of course, says, am I a Jew? It's your own nation, it's your own chief priests. They've delivered you over to me. What have you done uh, to deserve this type of condemnation? And notice that Jesus reminds them, because you see, Pilate is thinking, Jesus is going to raise up an insurrection, he's going to raise up this revol revolutionary army against Rome, and Jesus quickly reminds him in verse 36 that my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is not this physical kingdom like Rome has. In fact, Jesus said later in the Garden of before the Garden of Gethsemane, if I wanted to, I could call upon my Father and He could provide legions of angels who can come and fight for me and rescue me. But He says, if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, that is, the Jewish religious establishment. But my kingdom is not from the world. 
His kingdom is a heavenly kingdom, but it's a kingdom that will one day come to this world. That's why we pray, Thy kingdom come. And one day that kingdom will be physically manifested in the world. But right now, Christ is building His kingdom. There's a spiritual kingdom of which we are all part of. And Christ is raising a new generation, a new humanity, where He is the head, the new Adam, the last Adam. And He is changing people around the world. And the moment He says, my kingdom, you cannot have a kingdom without a king. And so, even though Pilate is saying, are you the king? And He says, is that your own words? Or has someone told you? Jesus is basically saying, I am a king. Because you can't have a kingdom without a kingdom. And if you speak of a kingdom, and it's your kingdom, then obviously you must be a king. And so Pilate responds correctly, so you are a king. And Jesus says, you say that I'm a king. In other words, it's as you've said it. You know how we say sometimes in English, you said it. And Jesus is saying, you've said that I'm a king. And notice what he says, for this purpose I was born. And for this purpose I came into the world. Notice Jesus is a man on a mission. He is a man with a purpose. This is not an accident of history. This isn't the, oh my goodness, Jesus was murdered by the Jews, so we're going to attack the Jews now. And we're going to start running around saying Christ is king. Or it's the Romans who killed him. And, and so we're going we're gonna to hate the Roman people. No, 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 no. His purpose was to come into the world, to die, and it was also to come into the world to bear witness to the truth. He came to bear witness to the truth. And then he makes this statement. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And so there are people out there claiming to be followers of Jesus. Like Muslims say, we love Jesus, but we also love Muhammad. But they don't love Jesus because they deny that Jesus died on the cross, that he rose from the dead, that he's the son of God. And so Jesus says, whoever is of the truth, hears my voice. Well, if you deny who Jesus is, you're not talking about the real Jesus. You're not listening to his voice. The Iglesia Ni Cristo in, in the Philippines is not listening to his voice. And then you've got this guy, Apollo, who claims to be the appointed son of God, who's now under trouble with the government in the Philippines. He claims to be the appointed son of God, and that he's been persecuted, and, and his sufferings is like Jesus' sufferings. What utter blasphemy. What utter blasphemy. They're not of the truth. They need the gospel of truth. They need the gospel that Jesus Christ came into the world, the gospel about Jesus, not about some guy who thinks he's the second coming of Jesus and making himself rich at the backs of the poor. And then Pilate becomes philosophical here. And Pilate says, what is truth? You'll notice Jesus doesn't answer that question because Pilate is staring at the truth. It's right under his nose. He is looking at truth incarnate because this same Jesus told us in John 14, I am the way, I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He's looking at the truth. And here's the irony. Jesus stood before the Sanhedrin the night before, where the Jewish judges were putting him on trial, a kangaroo court. They violated all the laws of the judiciary. They were not supposed to have a trial during the night. It's against the law of Moses. You cannot try a man in the night. It must be done during daylight hours so that the public can witness it. That's why people, when they go to court, there's a section where the public can sit down and watch the court proceedings. And so they had a trial in the night, which is illegal. He was not allowed to face his accusers. That's illegal. The witnesses didn't agree with one another, and yet they still held them under trial. If the witnesses can't agree, the court has to dismiss it. It was an unfair trial. It was a travesty of justice. And here's the irony. They're putting the judge of all the earth on trial when he's the one who's going to try them at the end of time. And he says, you shall see the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. And that Son of Man in Daniel 7 is the one who's going to judge the nations. And now you've got this secular ruler, Pontius Pilate, putting the judge of all the earth on trial. And the irony here is that the one 
that is the judge is being judged by the corrupt judges of the world. And God is mocking them. You may not see it, but in all of this, God is mocking the world, showing that this one who is the true judge, he is the one that is going to judge Pilate, and he's the one who's going to judge Caiaphas, and he's going to put them under judgment. And so Pilate goes back and forth, and, and he gets very nervous because once Jesus says that, his kingdom is from another place. He's very nervous as a, as a pagan Gentile. He knows about the Roman gods and he knows about how some of these Roman gods have, have mortal progeny, mortal offspring. And so he's getting nervous about this. He tries to find ways to let Jesus go. Not because he liked the Jews, but he was trying to get back at the Jewish leaders because he hated them. Some people think that Pilate was a good guy. He was just being friendly with Jesus. No, not at all. He wanted to get back at the Jewish leaders and not give in to them. And so what does he do in John 19, 1, verses 1 to 3? It says that he took Jesus and he flogged them. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and they put it on his head and they arrayed him in a purple robe. And they said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him with their hands. Now what's going on here is that the Roman flog is so brutal that the Jews were not allowed to whip people unless it was 40 minus 1. And so when the Jews would inflict scourging or whipping, it had to be 40 minus 1. Why? So that they would not miscount. So that justice would be maintained. But the Roman flogging was very different. There was no limit. And when they beat the victims, they would strip them of all their clothes, they'd be naked, they'd tie them to the whipping post, and the Roman flog, the whip, had pieces of bone, sharp pieces of bone, and metal balls attached to it, sometimes called the cat and nine tails. And as they flogged the person, those metal balls would in, impose bruise marks on the body, and those sharp pieces of bone would rip the flesh, sometimes ripping the capillaries and the veins, so much so that in some cases we're told that some of the victims the, the muscles from their abdomen would be so ripped apart that you could see the intestines. And on the back, when they ripped the skin from the back, you could see sometimes the spine, the vertebrae of the spine. That's why some people died at the whipping post. And sometimes their face would be ripped because the whip would wrap around their face and it, it would rip the skin off the face. And Isaiah said that his appearance, his visage, his appearance was so marred that we turned our faces from him. He was so brutally beaten that we turned our faces from him. We couldn't even look at him. That's how bad he was beaten. And so he was flogged. And it says that they took a crown of thorns and they twisted it and they put it on his head. And, and it wasn't like a wreath. The way we see it is like a, a headband made of thorns. It's not the way it was. It was more like a cap. Think of a, a cap filled with Thorns. That's how kings wore their crowns. And so it was more like a cap and it pierced his scalp on the top of his head and it pierced his forehead. And they are mocking him as a king, but here's the irony. The irony is they're actually acknowledging the king in the ironic twist as they give him a crown and then they array him in a purple robe because kings were arrayed in, in purple attire. They were actually worshipping the true king, the one that Israel should have worshipped and acknowledged. These pagan Romans are bowing to him and saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Look at that title, King of the Jews. Where have we heard that before? Well, a couple of months ago, we were celebrating Christmas. And we remembered the, the, the words of the Magi. Where is he who is to be born, King of the Jews? The Gentiles came looking for him. He who was born, the king of the Jews, we've come to worship him. And here are these pagans calling him by the same title, the Messianic title, the king of the Jews. They're bowing before him. And little do they know they're actually worshiping the true king. He is the true king, not Caesar. Notice he takes that crown of thorns on his head. Why? Because you see way back in Genesis 3, when man sinned against God, the curse on the ground was that the ground shall give you thorns and thistles, and you will work hard by the sweat of your face to eat your bread. The thorns and the thistles are symbols of the fall. And the last Adam takes the curse on his head. 
And the last Adam bears the curse that the first Adam incurred. The last Adam takes the curse on his head because one day he's going to make all things new. He has already started the progress. And one day there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem in which dwells righteousness and the curse will be removed. You need to understand that in the Garden of Gethsemane, the word Gethsemane, it's an Aramaic word that means the place of crushing olives. He was crushed in that garden. Why is he in a garden? Well, the first Adam, he was in a garden. The first Adam was in a garden where God had placed him with his wife Eve. And we know that the fall took place in a garden and the redemption will take place in another garden. The plans of redemption are in effect in another garden, the Garden of Gethsemane. Adam partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Christ was nailed to the tree to bring salvation to the world. Adam reached out as his wife to obtain the forbidden fruit. And Christ's hands were pierced on the tree. The ground upon which Adam and Eve walked that was cursed with their feet, the last Adam would have his feet pierced. Adam and Eve, when they heard God walking in the garden in Genesis 3, 7 to 8, they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden. He walked there. He walked in the flesh. He was incarnate. This was God the Son walking among them and talking to them. They ran and they hid among the trees of the garden because they were naked and they ran to hide their shame. But the last Adam hung upon a tree, naked, stripped of his clothes, he bore our shame for us and he conquered and healed the separation between man and God that was incurred in the Garden of Eden. He hangs naked on a cross. The first man hid himself out of shame after the sin by hiding among the trees. The last Adam is exposed. You'll notice that in the pictures of Jesus' crucifixion, that is something that is rarely seen. Even the pictures we saw here today in our musical presentation, they dared not present Christ naked. But he was. Even Mel Gibson in The Passion of the Christ didn't do that. Why did they do that? To shame the victim. To heap shame upon them. And so we read here that they struck him with their hands and they beat him to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah 50 that I gave my back to the smiters. And I gave my face to those who plucked out the beard. He did not hide his face from shame and from spitting. And then we're told in verse 16 of, Matt, of John 19, we're told there that Pilate delivered Jesus over to be crucified. Now, we need to understand that the Jews did not execute people by piercing or crucifixion. Crucifixion was a Roman method of execution. It, was, it, it wasn't the Romans who first invented it. It was invented by the Persians around 500 BC. The Romans adopted it from the Persians. And it was the most despicable form of, of death. It was torturous. It was agonizing. And some Roman writers said suicide was preferable to being crucified. And therefore, to fulfill the prophecies that the Messiah would be pierced, God guaranteed that the Romans would be present in Jerusalem under Pontius Pilate. Because according to the form of execution among the Jews, you execute people by stoning. That's how God commanded it in the law of Moses. And to hang an accursed criminal on a tree after he's been stoned. But the Romans didn't stone people. The Romans killed people by piercing them to the cross. And so when David said in Psalm 22, 16, they pierced my hands and my feet, David lived a thousand years before Christ. There was no such thing as crucifixion in the time of King David. He'd have to wait another 500 years. Where did David get the idea that his son would be pierced through his hands and feet? God revealed it. Isaiah 53, he was pierced for our transgressions. The punishment that was due to us was laid on him. So the Messiah had to be pierced. And that's why 
Pilate is in town. God is in total control here. And so Jesus is condemned to be crucified. And so he goes out and he bears the cross beam on his back. It wasn't the full T-shaped cross. That's another historical misrepresentation. It was the cross beam. He carried it on his back. And then at the place of crucifixion, they would have raised it, nailed the hands to the cross beam, raised it on the vertical beam, and then nailed his feet to the base. And so here we see he carries the cross on his back, just like that son 2,000 years before him, Isaac, we're told, Abraham said, God has told us to go up to Mount Moriah to offer up a burnt offering unto him. And Isaac goes with his father, and it says, Abraham put the wood on his back. And Isaac carried the wood on his back. And the rabbis told us that when Isaac carried the wood on his back, it was like one carrying his cross to his death. And here he is, the son of Abraham, the seed of the woman, the promised one, bears the wood on his back like Isaac, the one and only son, the son of promise, carried the wood on his back to the very mountain that David would conquer. And he would name that mountain Mount Zion. And he would build his headquarters, the city of Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, the place where Abraham said, God will provide a sacrifice. And God did provide a sacrifice. God would not allow Abraham to kill his son. He provided a ram caught in the thicket. And Abraham took the ram and he sacrificed the ram in the place of the son. And the ram, it says, was, his head was in the thicket. And that word thicket is a word for a thorny bush, a bush filled with thorns, so that the head of that ram was pierced. Does that remind you of anyone? But God allowed us to kill his son. I didn't kill Jesus. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. Because it was our sins that put him there. And if you were there 2,000 years ago, you would be among the crowds crying for his crucifixion. Look into your heart and you will see that it's true. Jesus goes to the place of the skull. The Aramaic word is Golgotha. The Latin word is Calvary. Calvary. Calvary is the Latin word for skull. I remember years ago, I was sharing the gospel with people. When I was a teenager, we'd go out on Friday nights to preach the gospel while our friends were getting drunk and high. We were going out to preach the gospel. I remember meeting an Indian man who come from India, and he asked me, we were sharing the gospel with him, and he says, Brother, can I ask you a question? I said, Sure. He goes, and You need to clarify something for me. I said, Go ahead. What is it? He said, why do Christians keep saying that Jesus died in Calvary? I said, Calvary? I said, don't you mean Calvary? He goes, isn't it Calvary? I said, no, Jesus has never been to Canada. <laughs> He's never in Alberta. When we say Calvary, it's the Latin word for place of the skull. In other words, it was the place of death. Whenever you see a skull, it's a sign of death. And so there they crucified him. And they put two others crucified on either side, and he was between them. What does this say? Well, the center, the, the place of honor is the center. When you're at the center of attention, right? You're at the center. Remember the transfiguration. It was Jesus, and then Moses and Elijah appeared with him. But he was in the center, the place of honor. Here's the king. Once again, the king is in the place of honor. And he is flanked by two criminals on either side. These two criminals represent the world. One accepts Christ, the other one rejects him. There's only two types of people in the world. Those who receive Christ and those who reject Christ. There's no middle place. And so there he is, the king, with his crown, is crucified on his throne. The king is exalted. He's lifted up. And everyone looks at that and says, what a horrible scene. But in the eyes of God, it is a pure and it is a sweet smelling savor. The king is enthroned between two criminals on the throne of his cross with the crown on his head, with the title, this is the king of the Jews. Amazing. The cross, St. Augustine said, was the pulpit from which Christ preached his good news and his love to the world. The cross was his pulpit 
from which he preached his love to the world. What a savior. And, wrote, and Pilate is the one who wrote that inscription. This is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. The religious leaders were upset at this because Nazareth, you see, Nazareth was so insignificant. It was a backwater village. It was the most insignificant village in the world. Even Josephus doesn't mention it in his geography of the land of Israel. The Talmud doesn't mention it. It was so insignificant. People actually thought people from Nazareth were like hillbillies. You know the hillbillies? You know, yeehaw, we're going to rule the world. We're going we're gonna to destroy the world. That's what they thought. And, and now you're saying that, that this Jewish carpenter from, from Nazareth, of all places, Nazareth, he's the king? And so the religious leaders, they don't want that. They don't want to acknowledge him as king. Before, in, in John 19, verse 6 and 7, the, the religious leaders blasphemed and they broke the first commandment by saying, we have no king but Caesar. What an act of betrayal. What an act of treason. We have no king but Caesar. This Roman pagan emperor is our king, and yet you reject the king of kings, the Lord of lords, and you, you, you repeat what their forefathers did with, with Samuel when, when the people wanted a, a king to be like the other nations, and Samuel is upset, and God says to Samuel, it's not you that they've rejected. It's me that they've rejected from being king. And here they are again repeating history, choosing a person that God did not appoint and rejecting his appointed king. There's the title above his head. And just in case people didn't understand what it said, it was written in three languages, in Hebrew or Aramaic, in Greek and Latin. Why? Because the Passover, there were tons of people, hundreds of thousands of people were in Jerusalem. People came into the city, and so they would be able to read that this is the king. And where he was crucified, folks, was not a private area. It was not a corner. It was a thoroughfare. There was a lot of human traffic walking by. It was done on the roadsides to show the people, you don't mess with Rome. You mess with Rome, this is what happens to you. So there he is, hang, hung on a cross, naked, his flesh torn, his face unrecognizable. And he hung there for six hours. Six hours from 9 in the morning till 3 p.m. It's a Friday. It's the sixth day of the week. It's the day of preparation. Notice that he dies on the same day that God created man. Man was made on the sixth day of the week. He dies on the sixth day of the week to redeem humanity. And they see him hanging there. He wasn't ashamed of us. And yet so many of us are ashamed of him. We will mention his name in the workplace. I don't want people to know that I'm a Christian. They're going to start making fun of me. I might lose my job, you know. I don't want to be canceled. I don't want to lose my friends. He didn't. He wasn't ashamed of you. How can we be ashamed of him? Do you count the cost? I have. I lost an academic position in one seminary because I took a stand against the corruption of our government and I, I said, Justin Trudeau hates Christians, which he does, it's, it's public record. And for that I was released because I chose Christ over Caesar. Have you count the cost? He was not ashamed of us. He said, if anyone's ashamed of me, I will be ashamed of him or her when I come in my Father's glory. Whoever denies me before men, I will deny before my Father. Whoever confesses me before men, I will confess before my Father. So here's the king. We're told that the soldiers that had crucified him, in chapter 19, verse 23, they took his garments and they divided them into four parts. That's how we know he was stripped. He was stripped naked. Not just his garments, they took his tunic as well. He was completely naked. And they divided his garments. Why did they do that? Well, you see, 
Romans were like, oh, well, I want a piece of him. This is a trophy. I mean, Jesus is, I mean, everyone knows about this guy. This guy claimed to be a king. I want a piece of him so I can remember. This is like a trophy that I'm going to keep in my room. And notice it also says that his tunic, his tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. What does this say? That the tunic was seamless. It, 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 was, it was so seamless that it was so nice that they didn't want to destroy it. They said, let's not destroy it. Let's cast lots for it. Well, what does this tell us? Who wore the seamless tunic? Well, if you know your Old Testament, you will know that the high priest wore the seamless tunic. Jesus is the priest. He is the great high priest. He's our great high priest. He is dressed like the high priest. He has a seamless tunic from top to bottom. And it's at the cross that Jesus is consecrated as a priest. It's there that he offers up the sacrifice and being the sacrifice. He is the sacrifice, sir, and the sacrifice at the same time. He offers himself, his own body, his own blood. And so here we see our great high priest being consecrated at the cross. And you know, folks, that today there is one who stands before the Father, who is our great high priest, who ever liveth to make intercession for the saints. Just like the great high priest had the ephod on his chest, with the 12 precious stones that had the names of the tribes of Israel so that when God saw the high priest, he saw his people. So he bears your name. Your name is engraven on his hand. And so when God looks at Jesus, he sees us. Our federal head, our federal representative, the one who represents his people. The last Adam who has brought up, raised up a new people, a redeemed people, a regenerated people. And that's why when we despair, we look up on high and we see him there, whoever lives to make intercession. And the Father never turns away the requests of the Son. It's not Mary up there who's interceding for you. He's interceding for her, and he's interceding for you, and he's interceding for all his people. And the scriptures are being fulfilled. Psalm 22, they divided my garments among them for my clothing. They cast lots. And so there's Jesus on the cross. There's the king. There's our great high priest. He's not just a priest, folks. He's a king. He's the priest king. He is like Melchizedek, who is the priest of Elion, the priest of the Most High. But he's also, Melchizedek means king of righteousness. He's the king of Salem, the king of Jerusalem. He is the priest king, but he's also the prophet. He is prophet, priest, king. The perfect prophet, priest, king. And then he wants to show us that those who are in him, he shows us that we are all family. Did you know, brothers and sisters, did you notice I, I said good afternoon in Tagalog? And then I called you all brothers and sisters. And that's because Christ has created a new family. Do you know that we are part of the greatest family in the world? I got black sisters and black brothers. I got brothers and sisters in the Asian community, brothers and sisters in the Jewish community who know Mashiach, who knows Yeshua as Messiah. I've got Arabic brothers who know Yeshua al Masi, Ibn Allah, the Son of God. Son of God, Jesus the Messiah. I've got brothers and sisters in every nation. I mean, we are the real United Nations. We're the real United Nations. This is the new humanity. This is the new people that Christ has raised up. If you're in Christ, you will live. If you're in Adam, you will die. You're either in Adam or you're in Christ. And so at the cross, Jesus doesn't think about himself. He's not like the other thief who's saying, well, why don't you save us? Why don't you get us out of this? Jesus is on the cross, and notice that his heart flows through, through whom? His heart flows towards his mother and his beloved disciple. And as he sees his mother there, and just think of this for a moment, mothers out there, mothers, just think of your son being ripped to shreds, being nailed to a Roman cross, naked and insulted. Think of what that does to your heart. 
For the first three hours from 9 to 12, Jesus withstood the slander and the mockings of the crowds. If he was the Son of God, let him come down from the cross and we will believe in him. Let's see if God will deliver him. Quote in Psalm 22. They didn't even know what they were saying. The very words of Psalm 22. And then 12 o'clock something happens. This darkness comes upon the land. A darkness that has even been confirmed in sources outside the Bible. This darkness comes upon the land. And Jesus cries out, Eli, Eli, lama sabakani. My God, my God, why? Why hast thou forsaken? And, and he's stuttering. You know that he's stuttering. When he says those words, he begins to stutter. How do we know that? Because the, the bystander said, he's calling for Elijah. Because the name Elijah in Hebrew is Eliahu. And when he said, Eli, Eli, they thought he was saying Eliahu. And that was probably because of the agony and the strain that he was experiencing, that he was stuttering those words. And from 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock, the darkness. You want to know what that darkness was? It wasn't a solar eclipse. You can't have a solar eclipse during the Passover. There's a full moon. That darkness was the presence of God in judgment. When God comes in judgment, it says he covers himself in the darkness. And for the next three hours, God poured out his horrible fury on the Lamb. That was the moment where it says, it pleased the Lord to crush him, Isaiah 53, to make him a guilt offering. And God's wrath, that cup that he asked, is it possible, Lord, Father, is it possible, let this cup pass from me, that cup of Jeremiah 7, the cup of God's wrath that he's going to pour on the nations, he's going to make the nations drink that bitter cup to the dregs, and Jesus is going to drink that for the nations. And it's that cup. It's not the crucifixion. He's saying, is it possible that you can take that cup away? That cup of suffering, the cup of God's anger, the cup of His fury, the Son of God received the blast, the blow that should have been inflicted on us, Isaiah says. It fell on Him. At the cross, justice and mercy meet. The justice of God is met. His demands are met. His just demands are met. And at the same time, I see mercy mingled, coming down, mingled with blood and sweat. The cross is the answer. Muslims say, why do we need to say, why do we need someone to die for us? If God is forgiving. Where's the justice in that? There is no justice. You're just letting, you're mocking the justice of God. But in Christ, he meets the justice of God. And because of his sufferings, he brings mercy to us. He tells his mother, behold your son. In John's Gospel, you'll notice the mother of Jesus is never identified by name. John never calls her Mary. And people have wondered, why is that? Well, because Jesus gave his mother to the care of John. John wanted to protect her from the authorities. In fact, history tells us that she went to Ephesus with John in Asia Minor. She died there with the Apostle John. He was trying to protect her. The authorities would have wanted the mother of the Messiah, for sure. But notice he says, woman, this is your son. You hold your son. And this isn't a Roman Catholic thing. That mother is the mother of all believers. Of course Mary is our mother in Christ, but so is every woman is our mother in Christ. We're all part of the same family. And he tells her, you hold your son. This is your son. And it says that hour the disciple took her to his home. That's what Jesus was doing. He gave her into the care of his beloved disciple. Roman Catholics say, well, if he had brothers, if, if he had physical brothers, well, well, why didn't his brothers take care of the mother? Because Jesus wanted his mother to be taken care of by believing family. His brothers didn't believe in him until after the resurrection. You want to make sure that you have believing family that takes care of loved ones. Notice in verse 28, after this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, I want you to catch that, folks. You see, a king is sovereign. A king is in control. A good king knows when to do this and when to do that. And notice that Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, you see, this isn't some decrepit Jew on the cross 
who is suffering the mistreatments of the world, and he's this, he's he's just whining about it. No, 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 no. He was truly suffering, to be sure. But he was in total control. He knows that everything was now finished. And then he said, to fulfill the scripture, he said, I thirst. Why did he say that? Because Psalm 22 says, they gave me gall and vinegar for my drink. He was directly fulfilling the scriptures. He says, I thirst. And then it says, a jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and they held it to his mouth. And Jesus received the sour wine. Let me explain what this is. I'm going to get a little, this is going to get a little icky. It says that they took this sour wine and they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a branch and they, they lifted it to his mouth. What a lot of folks don't realize is that that sponge that is mentioned there, you know what a sponge does? A sponge absorbs water. That sponge that was used there was used like toilet paper for the Roman soldiers. When they would urinate or, or defecate, they would wash their private parts with that sponge. And they would use the vinegar as a disinfectant. And so they took this filthy, dirty thing, this filthy sponge, and remember, this is all about demeaning, insulting the victim. They took that sponge that was used for unsanitary purposes and filled it with sour wine and they lifted it to his mouth. The ultimate, ultimate insult. You see what it cost him? What humiliation he took on our behalf? And he received the sour wine. And then he said, it is finished. And notice it says, and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. When people are dying, do you ever see them go, okay now, I gotta go, high five. Okay, um, I gotta go, the Lord's calling me, I'll see you in heaven. He is in total control that he knows when it's finished, he says it's finished, and then notice what it says, he bowed his head and he died. He was in control even to the point of his death. No man takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord, and I raise it up. No one killed him. He delivered himself to be killed. He allowed himself to be killed. He laid down his life of his own accord, and he receives it. And then he says it's finished. All oh, the most sweet words of Scripture. Tetelestai in Greek, it's a perfect, it's a perfect indicative verb, meaning completed action in the past with ongoing results in the present. When he cried out, it is finished, you need to understand something. He was saying the bill is paid in full. It is done, it is consummated. See, you need to understand something, folks. In all the religions of the world, it's do, do, do this, do that, don't eat that, eat this, pray in that direction, pray like this, don't do that. It's all about do, do, do. And in the end, it is do, do. Because all our works are like what? Filthy rags before God. But in Christianity, it's done. Done. It's done. It's finished. Roman Catholicism, you got to go to penance. You gotta pray to St. Joseph and St. Anthony and St. Jude and Santa Maria and San Miguel and you gotta pray to St. Gabriel and you gotta pray to this saint and, 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 and go and touch his tongue in the church relic and, and go and touch the fingertip of St. Of saint, uh, of saint Benjamin. Roman Catholics walking on their knees up the stairs, St. Joseph's Oratory in Montreal. In the Philippines, there are people going out saying, I made a promise to God that I'd get crucified on Good Friday if He gives me something. And there they are, being nailed to, to crosses, mocking the Lord Jesus Christ, saying that your suffering wasn't enough. i got to add to it. you got the Muslims facing Mecca five times a day and praying, Bismillah, 
عرف مين؟ We don't, we don't eat pork because Allah doesn't want us to eat pork. And they're going to Mecca, running around the, 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 the Cuba Kaaba, a pagan practice that pagans have been doing for centuries before Muhammad, and then kissing and smooching the black stone, which is another pagan practice. Then you got the Hindus offering their, their pujas to the, to the gods, and, and then you got the Jewish people thinking that as long as we keep Shabbat and we keep the Sabbath, and as long as, as, as we go to the synagogue and, 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 and we go to Yom Kippur services and do that, as long as we do that, God's going to be happy. No, He's not happy. He hates religion, He hates religiosity. It's outward appearance to look good, to look virtuous. The Lord looks at the heart. He does not look like men look on the outward appearance. Our world is all about looks. You have people walking around. Girls are putting Botox into them that, that I can comb my hair in, in our foreheads because they're so shiny. Their lips are like four times their normal size. You can plug them against the window. They'd stay there. And the world says, that's beautiful, that's sexy. I want to be like Lady Gaga. I want to grow my hair like Justin Bieber. I want to wear Tommy Hilfiger, because that's what all the big guys wear. But what's your heart look like? I want to be pretty, I want to be handsome, I want to look like that. And God looks at the heart, and your heart is so ugly, your heart is so disgusting, your heart is so dirty, that only the blood of Jesus can cleanse it. Our world seeks after vain glory. It's all about the outward appearance. It's all about how you dress, what's the style. You know, I don't even know how to wear my tie anymore. Is it a big tie, is it a thin tie? Should I, you know, should I be like this? Should I be walking around like this? Should I be bell bottoms? I gotta check the fashion industry. How, you know, how am I supposed to dress today? Everything's about the world. And all these things are passing away. And so Jesus cries out, it is finished. It's done. And folks, today, if you don't know the Savior, you're lost. You'll never find peace with God. You can go to the New Age movement and, you know, I'm going to do yoga. I'm going to look at my navel and I'm going to go, om, om. And I'm going to have, I'm going to become enlightened. No, you're not. You could stare at your navel all day and you'll never be enlightened. You'll probably find some lint in there, but you need Jesus. That's what Good Friday is about, folks. We're told here in verse 31 is the day of preparation. That's the technical word for Friday, the day of preparation to prepare for the, the Sabbath. And they didn't want the bodies on the cross on the Sabbath. That Sabbath was a high day because it was the Sabbath of the Passover week, so it was extra special. And so the Jews don't want the, the, the bodies on the cross. They asked Pilate that their legs might be broken. This is a practice, the Romans practice, it's called crudifagium. It, it means to break the shin bones of the, of the legs. And why would they do that? Well, because when you're crucified, you, your body slouches, and in order to breathe, you have to rise up so that your rib, rib cage could expand, and then uh, you inhale and then exhale, and your rib cage has to expand. Well, after a while, after pushing yourself up and feeling the, the pain running through the nerves of your arms because they, they penetrated the medial nerve in the, in the wrists, that pain was like electricity running through your body and then the nerves on the feet, the most sensitive parts, you'll notice there, there's this intense pain. And after a while, they get tired, they're exhausted, they're dehydrated, they're bleeding out. And so a way to hasten death was by breaking the shin bones, the person could no longer rise to breathe and so they would die of asphyxiation. Brutal form of dying, you suffocate to death. But Jesus, because he was already dead, they didn't break his legs. But a soldier, just to make sure, a soldier took a spear and pierced him in the side. And John says, I saw water and blood come out of the side. Well, let me explain something. None of his bones were broken. Why? Exodus 12, the Passover lamb, God said, not one of its bones will break. They must have no broken bones. Number two, the psalm said, not one of his bones will be broken. That is why, folks, they couldn't put the nails through the hands, the palms. They put it through the wrist between the bones here. The same with the feet. And you need to understand something that 
when they pierce them, they will fulfill the scripture, they will pierce, they, he will be pierced, and they will look on him whom they pierced, and, and therefore, by piercing his heart, they didn't break any of his bones, by piercing his heart, John then says he saw this blood and this water come out of his side. Now, we now know today what that is. John didn't know what it was. He didn't know what the medical term for that was. Well, we now know what that was. And, and Jewish, uh, excuse me, medical journals have been, have been written on this point. When a person is in intense pain and agony, like crucifixion, your heart, around your heart, you have a thin membrane. It's called the pericardial membrane. It's a thin membrane that covers the heart. When someone is experiencing intense agony and pain, the pericardial membrane inflates with what's called pericardial effusion. It's a water-like substance. That looks, it's clear, like water. And it, it's like when you have water in your lungs. Because Jesus died the way he did, he had this membrane inflated, it was covered in pericardial fluid, and his lungs would have had water in them. That is the sign of cardiac arrest. That is also a sign of hypovolema shock. Jesus died of a ruptured heart. His heart ruptured. He literally died of a broken heart. And so when they pierced the side, what did John see? He saw blood, which would have collected in the chambers of the heart. That blood issued out and it was mixed with a clear fluid, which means that the pericardial uh, fluid around the heart had inflamed, he had uh, uh, fluid in his lungs, and so John could only describe it as water. He didn't know what it was. We now know that that is proof that Jesus not only was already dead, but that he suffered a major cardiac arrest. That explains the blood and the water together. So you know when people say that my heart's broken, or you hear of loved ones, I remember that when my grandmother passed away, my father's mother passed away, my grandfather died four months to the day. He gave up living because she was his everything. And he told me he had no reason to live anymore. And four months to the day, he died of a cardiac arrest, a massive cardiac arrest. So the Lord Jesus dies for his own. And not only that, but if you remember when Queen Elizabeth passed away, our dear queen, a wonderful lady, you will remember how her funeral had a lot of pomp, a lot of ceremonialism. This king who dies is going to receive a royal burial. Why? Well, we didn't read it, but if you read the rest of John 19, we're told that Joseph of Arimathea came. And John's the only one who tells us that there was a second member of the council who came to assist Joseph of Arimathea, and that was Nicodemus. And if you look at the amount of spices that they were using, the mixture of myrrh and aloes, it was 75 pounds in weight. That is the amount that is not only a very expensive amount, that is what you would give to a king when he died. And so the king of kings is given a royal burial by Joseph and Nicodemus. And just as God created the heavens and the earth in six days and he rested on the seventh, Jesus enters Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, the first day of the week. And according to the Passover, the lamb had to be selected and then for four days, the lamb had to be quarantined so they can inspect it, make sure there's no blemish on it so that it would be ready to be sacrificed. So for the next four days, that lamb has to be quarantined and inspected very closely. What happens to Jesus? He enters Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. The next four days, the religious leaders are inspecting him very carefully. They're testing him. They're questioning him, trying to find a blemish in him. And you know what they found? Nada. He had no blemish. 
which means he was qualified to be the sacrifice. And so Jesus dies on the day that man was created, and just as God rested on the seventh day, what does the God-man do? He rests in the tomb. Before Friday night, before the beginning of the Sabbath, they bury him on Friday afternoon, and then he rests in the tomb, just as he did from all his creative works. And then he rises again on the first day of the week, on the eighth day, the day of new beginning, the day of the new creation. The number eight is the number of recreation. That's why children were circumcised on the eighth day. That is why the Feast of Tabernacles, there was the final day, the eighth day, the great day of the feast, Jesus proclaimed, all who are thirsty come to me and drink. The eighth day, he rises again. A new week, a new day, a new covenant based on better promises, a new mediator, a new high priest. And so folks, we come here today not to celebrate a funeral. We come here today to celebrate the king and the victory of the king. And folks, those of you again, if you are here today and you're just here because it's just practice, it's tradition, I'm here, it's Good Friday, I'm here because my family are Christians, this is the day. Today is the day of salvation. Jesus Christ paid the penalty that you could never pay. You will never stand before God justified. You can appear before him one day and God's going to bring your life up and say, okay, just like in a courtroom, uh, we've got you under surveillance right here. Here's the video evidence. Did you lie? Yeah. Did you commit adultery? Did you murder people in your heart? You have no right to enter God's kingdom. But Jesus Christ paid the penalty for you. He paid the debt that you did not owe. He paid a debt that he did not owe because you owed a debt that you could not pay. And God offers you forgiveness today. He offers you reconciliation today. And if you let this day go by, what guarantee do you have that you'll be alive tomorrow? Or next week? Or next month? Or next year? You know how fragile life is. You don't know what day brings. But Christ offers you eternal life today. He died with his arms outstretched to welcome you, to embrace you, he loves you to the cross and back. But if you don't know him, you're going to face him as your judge one day. You'll either be your savior or your judge. And so I implore you on this Good Friday, turn from your sins, repent of your sins, believe that he came, that he died on the cross of Calvary, that he rose again, and that you accept him as Lord and Savior, that you will trust him for everything. And he promises you peace, reconciliation. Do it today. Do it today. Jesus is passing by. Don't let him pass you by.